Firstly, was it impossible for the cabinets of Madrid to achieve the preferential treatment for Spanish products, but also issues such, such as the distribution of the debts inherited by, uh, from the wars of independence weighed heavily in, on the interlocutions, uh, delaying the signing of the treaties. Mutual distrust increased due to the expansive foreign policy undertaken by the, uh, by the long government of the Liberal Union, which in 1861 annexed Santo Domingo and in 1862 participated with France and the United Kingdom in the armed intervention in Mexico. The immediate consequence of these policies was to spread uh, the rumor that Spain was preparing to interfere and reconquer its former viceroyalties. The fear was extreme in some republics that, like Peru, had not seen their independence fully recognized by any kind of international treaty. This fact increased uh, exponentially the tensions dragging on with uh, the colonies of Spanish citizens in the country, the, emig the Spanish emigrants, okay? Therefore, it should come as no surprise that in February 1862, La America dedicate, dedicated its broad exposition of, a spa of a Spain's revived naval power to the overseas republics. The message was not challenging to identify. The monarchy had re-emerged as a maritime power and was now in a position to sustain gunboat diplomacy, analogous to that employed by the British and French empires to impose their interests in the region over the last decades. For, from their point of view, uh, the Real Armada, now adapted to the logistical and armament requirements of 19th century imperialism, was emerging as an instrument cap capable of asserting Spain's influence in, in its former dominions, protecting the interests of its commerce and achieving the preferential treatment that diplomatic contacts had failed to provide until that moment. So the US strategic uh, theorizations of La America did not take long to become reality. On August 10 of that same year, 1862, the propeller frigates Resolución and Victoria left the port of Cádiz bound for South America. Commanded by the Admiral Luis Hernández Pinzón, both ships made up the so-called Pacific Squadron. Uh, Pacific Squadron, sorry. Destined to make a circumnavigation that would take it from the Brazilian coast to California. The curious thing about the case is that the instructions delivered to the squadron by the ministers of state and the Navy harmonized perfectly with the postulates, uh, postulates sustained six months earlier by the editors, editors of La America. The documents that contained them indicated to the expedition officers that they should promote the process of diplomatic normalization with the South American republics fostering with their interpe interpellations and public actions a genuine feeling of pan-Hispanic reconciliation. Secondly, the voyage was to serve to exhibit before Spanish-American societies their renewed Spanish naval power, and at the same time, to train the officers and sailors of the crew in modern navigation techniques. Ministerial planners were confident that this seemingly virtuous mix of diplomatic persuasion and display of maritime power would enable the monarchy to fulfill a set of strategic goals, penetrate the promise in one of markets of, of the Pacific, achieve competitive advantage for peninsular trade in the area, guarantee the security of Spanish subjects living in the republics, and ultimately gain renewed geopolitical influence over Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and even Brazil. The proposed combination of cultural and political persuasion, gambled diplomacy, and economic imperialism was not, as a Spanish historiography has pointed out, uh, the fruit of an Im improvised policy of prestige. It's, it was not improvised. Through this paper, I have tried to demonstrate that the dispatch of the Pacific Squadron was rooted in the geopolitical imaginaries of Spanish liberalism during the decades that followed the collapse of the old overseas empire and the end of absolutism. The loss of the dominions of continental America after the wars of independence flanked uh, the elites of 19th century Spain into a deep reflection on the basis for a potential recovery of geopolitical power of, uh, of the geopolitical power of the Spanish monarchy. Usually, 
the debate revolved around the naval weakness that Spain had exhibited vis-a-vis -vis, uh, its European counterparts. What I have uh, attempted is to explain how, in the context between the 1830s and the early 1860s, a series of organic intellectuals linked to ministerial decision-making and the Real Armada placed the modernization and expansion of the Navy as the key to the transatlantic regeneration of Spanish power. This thalassocratic ideal, inspired by the pessimistic interpretation of the imperial past and the emulation of the British model, motivated the, na the naval rearmament uh, policies that culminated in the organization of the Pacific Squadron in 1862. I have aimed to combine the perspectives of maritime history and intellectual history in order to reconstruct uh, the process by which the reinvention of the Spanish monarchy as a 19th century thalassocracy, homologated with the British and French empires, motivated an expansive policy in the, in the Pacific, culminating, obviously, in the outbreak of the spanish South American War in 1864. Now I will offer you a very, very brief synthesis of the epigraphs that compose the paper. I begin by explaining the naval thought that proliferated during the reign of Fernando VII, Fernando VII, which was characterized by quasi-total uh, destruction of the Spanish Navy, triggered by the defeat of Trafalgar, uh, the Napoleonic Wars, and the conflict for Latin American independence, as, as Jorge knows. Faced with the threat, the threat sorry, of the disappearance of the maritime culture that had maintained the Real Armada as one of the most powerful in the world, several texts tried to identify, to identify the, cause, uh, the causes of, now, of, of Spanish naval decadence in order to propose recovery programs. Officers such as Seferino Ferret and the Minister Luis Maria de Salazar acted as publicists uh, with works that coincided in pointing out some medium and long-term historical factors that explain why the British Royal Navy had prevailed in the struggle for the seas. However, the proposals of these authors were not too unconventional and took up uh, the old arguments of arbitrism and enlightened, uh, enlightened reformism. Their essential aim was not to fundamentally alter the nature of Spanish maritime culture, nor its, nor its, roles, uh, its role in the dynamics of imperial governance. On the contrary, they sought to implement a series of fiscal and administrative reforms that would preserve the territorial integrity of the monarchy in both hemispheres and protect the monopoly trade between peninsular and Spanish American ports. These axioms were congruent with the aspirations of reconquest that guided the administrations of the reign of uh, Fernando VII. While the opera operational capacity of the Real Armada languished without remedy, the hope was maintained that the cooperation of the monarchist powers of Europe would allow the regeneration of the imperial system of the ancient regime and return Spain to the status quo before the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, in a second epigraph, that is probably more valuable, uh, I explain how the situation of the Real Armada didn't vary drastically in the inaugural period when their liberal elites took, took control of the Spanish state. Uh, this period, well, as you can see in the presentation, goes from 1834 to 1848. Concerning naval policy, the picture was one of continuity with the neglect and impotence of Fernando's reign. Budgetary shortage and the impossibility of establishing long-term planning amid political turmoil frustrated any serious attempt of naval reconstruction. The state of anomie contrasted with the obligations of a navy that had to continue to assert a Spanish interest on a global scale. The Spanish state had that emerged from the transatlantic schism that at the beginning of the century retained the important island territories of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Consequently, the liberal elites, uh, elites based their nation-building projects on maintaining the status of the monarchy as a colonial power with transatlantic and transpacific interests. The timid, incoherent, and conservative, uh, conservative character of the maritime policies of the period tends to hide, however, a phenomenon of no little relevance the emergence of an ideological project of naval regeneration linked to the objectives of pan-Hispanism, Iberianism, 
and Spanish liberal imperialism. I achieved this conclusion after an exhaustive analysis of the works of some leading figures of Spanish liberalism, such as Pedro Pardo de Urquinanoa, Alejandro Llorente, and Alejandro Liván, and newspapers also, such as El Tiempo, El Español, El Heraldo, or La España Marítima. Eh? The political intellectual architects of the new constitutional state contributed to forging a new maritime culture based on the myth of the nation's naval renaissance. However, this imagined revival did not imply the total restitution of sovereignty over the American continent. On the contrary, the expectation was that of, was that of a thalassocratic metamorphosis. The desire was to create a modern navy, comparable to those of the British, French, and Americans, as a condition of possibility for the forging of a second Spanish empire based on the domination of the seas. This dominion was conceived as the pedestal on which to ensure the preservation of the remaining colonial possessions, the rejuvenation of the merchant navy, the recovery of peninsular economy, and the gain of formal and informal spheres of power in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Thus, the period from 1824 to 1848, also uh, characterized by the stag stagnation of the Real Armada, witness the ideological elaboration of a thalassocratic imperial horizon, substantially influencing the naval regeneration policies undertaken in the subsequent, in the, in the subsequent stage. A Spanish maritime historiography cons, coincides in pointing out the year 1848 as a turning point. Mariano Roca de Togores, Marquis of Molins, was appointed Minister of the Navy on this date. Molins managed uh, to sort up uh, the budgetary and administrative basis to partially materialize the oceanic regeneration dreams elaborated in the previous, in the previous 15 years. Between 1848 and 1862, a respectable steam fleet was progressively chartered. Concerning naval thought, since 1848, it is appreciable a systematization of the objectives associated with the, with the thalassocratic regeneration of the state. Significantly, at this period, the sailor and journalist Jose Ferrer de Couto published an extensive history of the Real Armada, which underpinned the naval mythology of Romanticism, cultivating the archetypal image of the Spanish sailor as the heroic a subject who was destined to recreate the maritime glories of his national ancestors. Ferrer de Couto associated the cultivation of naval patriotism with the recovery of the Spanish people's oceanic vocation and the consequent restoration of the geopolitical status of the monarchy. In line with his statements, the Spanish state endeavored to include the cult of the navy among its nationalization policies. In 1843, the Naval Museum of Madrid had already been created, and the press recurrently announced its exhibits and collections. The general states of the Navy and the maritime newspapers and magazines, such as the Crónica Naval de España, at the same time endeavored to publish heroic, heroic portraits of the Iberian sailors, explorers, and discoverers of the past inviting 19th century audiences to emulate their pretended sense of love for the homeland, for science, and the expansion of civilization. Following in the wake of these nationalism speeches, Molins promoted the creation of the pantheon of illustrious sailors in the coastal city of San Fernando. The initiative, which imitated similar institutions in the United Kingdom, France, and Portugal, hoped to create a space or temple where the ecstatic rituals of naval patriotism, uh, patriotism could occur, okay? I'm finishing. So beyond its present in nationalization policies, the thalassocratic uh, ideal underwent, as indicated above, a process of systematization of its strategic objectives. The most relevant text in this field was a book called El Tratado de las Relaciones Internacionales de España, published in 1848. Uh, it contained the lessons uh, given at the Madrid Athenaeum by Professor Facundo Goñi, uh, a future diplomatic envoy of Spain in Chile, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and the United States. According to the professor, whose lectures were warmly received uh, in Madrid's political circles, 
Spain, spurred on by the modernization of the Real Armada, would rise in the form of a 19th century empire, much smaller than the first, but with its energies refocused and dedicated to expanding the markets and influence of the metropolis throughout the Mediterranean, the Atlantic, and the Pacific. Goni did not... Ah, I'm finishing. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, no, I, I'm going to stretch the conclusion. Uh, don't worry. Uh, what mm, I, I was going to explain a little bit the Goni's thinking, but... Uh, probably it's a, a redundance of, of what I have already said. Uh, so wait a moment. I'm going to finish the, the uh, let me see. The, there it is. There it is. Perfect. So I'm concluding. I'm concluding. Uh, given what we have exposed in the previous sections, it is not possible in, in, in my you know, my presentation, it is not possible to believe that the instructions that the ministers, that the ministries of the Navy and the state gave to the Pacific Squadron in 1862 were the fruit of a patriotic improvisation or a punctual strategic mistake. The political culture of Spanish liberalism had forged over two decades the idea that creating a pan-Hispanic sphere of influence would require the regeneration of the monarchy's naval power and its use according to the patterns of 19th century informal imperialism. Its political intellectual leaders asserted that the modernization of the Real Armada was the essential condition for creating a new Spanish empire based on the dominion of the seas, that is, on the thalassocratic model so successfully applied by the United Kingdom. Well, I think the paper has limited itself to reflecting modestly how the forging of maritime mythology in a pan-Hispanic key configured the horizons of expectation of liberal imperialism, having considerable performative effects on the foreign policy of the Elizabethan era and in the outbreak of the Spanish South American War. That's all. Sorry for uh, being so expansive. Uh, and I, I finish with, with this. Okay, thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, now we have a, you know, the presentation which just sounds fantastic. I don't know what exactly is that. Noticias de viejo imperio, views from the old empire, a work project primary from digital edition to digital storytelling. And this paper is going to be presented by two. Color, Alvaro Casilla, uh, who is from the Centro Europeo para la Discusión de las Ciencias Sociales in Spain. He holds a PhD in History, Cultural Thinking from the University of Alcoa. Uh, el estudio, el valorización, which is in Italian, el valorización del patrimonio histórico, artístico, arquitectónico, y ambiental, the University of Chen. Uh, his thesis has uh, systematically examined naval information revealed by the narratives elaborated by Spanish naval leaders and diplomats at the service of the Spanish monarchy and the Ottoman Empire known as the Sultanate of Suleiman the Magnificent. Through the implementation of new technologies, the old methodology in the analysis of historical documents, thus, his analysis satisfies the full research into. Reflecting the entire Ottoman naval system and evaluating his role as first hand information to explain a war of practicality uh, unknown to his potential readers. Uh, he's going to be joined in this effort by the Indians uh, from the Red of uh, Digital Humanity from Mexico, who's a member of the College of History, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, National Autonomous University of Mexico, a student of geography at the Universidad de Santiago de Compostela in Spain, and technical engineer by the main institution. Author of a number of papers and uh, research articles, he is founding member of the Red of Humanities, Digital Humanities, and uh, member of the Literary Committee of the Association the improvement of studies in Central America. A contributor to a number of, of publications, 
His research interests and focuses in digital edition for early modern cryptography, history of the ideas of limit and border, the implications on the presentation of digital methods for the humanity, the history and geography of early modern geological disasters. Okay, go ahead. Okay, um, can you see the PowerPoint now? It's all right. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can see. We can ah, okay, see okay, 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 okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, and before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers for the con for the, all the work uh, that they are done in this congress and all the participants for their presence here today. Um, today we are going to speak about the digital project Noticias del Viejo Imperio, 1860-1866, uh, which was born as a part of the Fondo de Research Initiation Project 2020, the La Expedición del Pacífico y la Guerra Hispano-Sudamericana en los Imaginarios Geopolíticos de la España Liberal, 1860-1866, supported by the, university, by the Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez and sponsored by the Government of the Republic of Chile. The debate that we hope to launch from it, it is born of a particularly interesting moment, a 19th century Spain that needed to redefine its role as an imperial nation in a continent opening up to such ideas. To achieve this goal, a series of transformation had to be implemented, ranging from the renewal of overseas governance system towards new liberal formulas, to the establishment of mechanism for informal economic domination over certain parts of South America or the updating of its outdated naval forces. Undoubtedly, one of the most original proposals put forward during the, this period was the formation of a global pan-Hispanic community in which the population of the former viceroyalties would be united with those of the Spanish state. Precisely, the project has chosen the Pacific Scientific uh, Expedition and the subsequent Spanish-South American War as two events in which all these issues experience a full effervescence. The goal is to analyze the impact that both historical events had on the establishment of the Pan-Hispanic community imagined by the political culture in Spain at that time. To this end, a set of textual and iconographic sources will be analyzed that were produced both during the planning and development of the expedition, as well as during the course of the war. In line with the objectives of the project and also with the idea of innovating the historian's professional practice, the digital project has taken on responsibility of generating a software system for the online publication, consultation and analysis of this set of sources, as well as the system for uh, the online publication of all of this. No? Um, throughout this talk, several strategies followed for the publication on the web of the sources chosen for this project will be uh, briefly presented to them. Uh, to them, so uh, the methods and technologies that have been implemented with the aim of elaborating multimedia historical narratives that take advantage of all the possibilities offered within the digital medium. Initially, a typology of relevant documents for their inclusion in this project was determined from the examination of the documentation preserved in different repositories, both European and American, and from the analysis of historiographic texts related to the historical process. For this selection of sources made in preliminary stage of the project, it was possible to distribute them into four sets according uh, to the expository forms they show, with the aim of using the most appropriate digital representation in each case, designed either for corpora or for standalone documents. Four general modes of expression were found chronological narratives, news fragments, politi political speeches, and diplomatic correspondence. Let us describe briefly, since this was the basis upon which the digital project was built. The first of these sets of corpora was constituted by historiographic narratives, travel diaries and expedition reports containing both warlike and scientific or diplomatic texts. These work are essential to understand the political and cultural background of the expedition uh, and the Spanish-South American War, showing the discourses of the Spanish intellectual elites, but also the dynamics of socialization of cultural representation regarding these historical processes and the testimonies of the sailors, diplomats, military, marines, and scientists who took direct part in the events studied in this project. The news can be divided into two subgroups, given that there is an officially, officially spread 
and a particular political press. The information contained therein, given its official character, character its typologically, typological diversity and its abundance, allow us to chronologically reconstruct the flow of non-confidential information produced and published about the expedition and the war, as well as the, uh, to a certain extent, the impact it had on the public sphere and on ministerial uh, decisions. As for the parliamentary acts, the Diario de Sesiones contains the historical parliamentary acts of the Kingdom of Spain. The information treasured in this documentary series allow us to approach the understanding of the political position that the various political groups held with respect with the Pacific Expedition and the subsequent Spanish South American War. Well, at the same time, it allow us to deepen our knowledge concerning the interference of the, this legislative chamber in the planning of the expedition and in the socialization of the ideological representation surround it, surrounding it. Finally, we have the documentation preserved in the historical archive of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a branch later integrated to the National Historical Archive in order to select diplomatic correspondence uh, relevant to this project. The documentation preserved within the branch is essential to understand the set of discourses, strategies, and expectations that guided the action of the ruling elites of the Spanish monarchy in the framework, framework of the planning of the expedition, its development, and the course of the Spanish South American War again. So uh, it is clear that uh, the sources um, accessible for the study of historical of this historical process distributed in in the aforementioned four categories correspond to four common forms of presentation in digital media. The narratives are usually associated, associated with cartographic representation, maps, especially in cases uh, such as this one, where uh, that we are going to, we are hope to show, uh, where they have a strong spatial, a spatial component. Fragments of news can be set against the development of historical facts by means of a parallel or composite timelines. Parliament's acts, full of debates in different positions, can best be presented and analyzed as comparative documentary editions. Diplomatic correspondence has been very commonly published for more than two decades as networks or graphs or interlinked information. These forms, whatever, which need uh, not necessarily follow each other are not mutually uh, exclusive. For now, the representation of information has been limited uh, to those mentioned above, adding that these narratives will also be presented at, as standalone uh, documentary editions. A couple of months ago, we critically, we critically approached the reading of Desmond Smith epilogue to Domenico, uh, Domenico Fiormonte latest book. Well, we had uh, been trained for to perform text, ta text tagging in the standard established by the Text Encoding Initiative, mainstream in the production of digital uh, scholarly edition, we are not yet prepared to see the end of the partnership established in um, 2003 20, with the development of XML as foreseen by Smith. Given the needs of publishing in multiple, multiple formats, the right from the sources using this project, we decided in an effort of resilience that it would be a good time to make certain adaptations to our training. So this project is based in, on forms inherited from the text markup language adapted to forms of JSON, the JavaScript object notation format, another markup language oriented to data serialization. We were already familiar with the software developments made by the Night Lab at the North Northwestern University, whose application and openness have encouraged teachers and researchers alike to approach the production of uh, scholarly digital objects. Two of their products, Story Map and Timeline, uh, both working with data, data inputs in JSON format, seemed at that time to be a good, good, uh, uh, two good tools that, in addition, being free and open source, could be easily adapted to the most demanding needs of this and any forthcoming project. Once the sources, standards, and publishing platforms were chosen, since all of them will have a place in the space of the Centro Europeo para la Difusión de las Ciencias Sociales, as and has in GitHub, the license and access rights were, rights were quite clear, given that the original sources belonged to the public domain and that the work done on them would be economic, uh, would have economic remuneration, 
all the digital objects produced in this project will be published under Creative Commons, Commons um, 1.0 universal license, thus adhering to the Budapest Open Access Initiative. The execution of this process, based on the decisions already explained, was carried out in three separate phases. The first one, cataloging divided into parts, second, transcription, and the third, editing. The first of these requires, requires required a new decision to be made on the standard that the metadata of the digital objects produced in this project should follow, should follow, opting for those developed by the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, an optimal choice, although it had to be adapted to the JSON schema instead of being mounted in, on a XML structure. This cataloging framework is thus endowed with greater flexibility without losing any of its original characteristic, specificity, discoverability, and retrievability. For the transcription rules, we can say that uh, it required a full representation of what was the, to be found in the documentation, even without the unfolding of the abbreviation. abbreviation. Only these previous choices allowed this constraint on our digital edition. A simplified version of the cataloging metadata would head the transcription, while the JSON files produced for online publication would contain the variant of the same in the markup language. So we have a little sample of this uh, pro uh, process to produce uh, uh, this map that we are going to produce. Um, so um, once these decisions had been made, it was necessary to apply a kind of segmentation on the information contained in the, in the documentary transcription in order to prepare them for their structure in, in, in JSON, this markup language. The technical documentation uh, of the selected software produced by NightLab perfectly explains the data necessary for the correct expression and parsing of the JSON files. The addition, the addition of a section of metadata for identification and description of the digital file, also in JSON format, are correctly identified by the software, but since they are not elements that can be processed by it, they are not presented in any way. That is, even though they are in the digital file, they are not going uh, to, no, they are not in the visualization. We will now show a continuous example of this pr uh, procedure. First, the entire document set is contained with key signs, uh, so that what is external to these signs, even if it's written in, in JSON, will not be processed by the software. The cataloging metadata schema will be as follows. Is this um, the, that I'm showing to you? So as can be seen, the readability of the metadata set written in the markup language is considerably superior to uh, the same metadata in the, its um, original XML file, which has binomial tags and attributes inserted continuously, resulting in much more complex structures. The general structure of the document is encompassed in a slides, elements, whose uh, values constitute a data matrix. Each of these value, values is a slide of a cartographic presentation, just the first of them being different as a cover of the word, a fact that is identified only by the appearance of a type element with an associated, associated overview value. Of course, the cover presents general data about work, not the specific information about its content. So this would be the uh, this data, this JSON data that we put um, to make this slide that later we're going to show in a map. So uh, you can see in there. Um, of course, each of the following slide has similar structure to this one. It's only the same structure in the second in that the second one. Um, and the information is continuous structure in a perfectly identified identifiable way. And it was uh, what will later appear in a display in different ways, depending on the alternation made to the design, which is contained in a single uh, C CSS file, a format analogous to JSON. The location of uh, the events is given in decimal coordinates, since as a cartographic base, this software allows using both Google Maps and OpenStreetMap. This second option is, of course, the most viable, since its data and map section are much more editable than those of the alphabet software. The toponym can follow whatever scheme is required, and each element value has the virtue of being able to express uh, to expressly contain HTMLA5, uh, uh, so that editorial forms and even hyperlinks can be integrated. In this project, it has been decided to use the icon element 
value to show an icon representing the main action taking place in the particular fragment of the serialization, and a line element allowing to define whether the slide shows a step of a path or if it's a break in the narrative. The text fragment is expressed, as we said, in, uh, in this language format, in this H at, uh, HTML5 format that allows the presentation of editorial forms and hyperlinks and is preceded by a headline element that allows each fragment to be titled separately so that both this element and um, un unique quit provide the correct identification of each fragment within the whole work. So, one, well, each slide, uh, sorry, uh, may or may not be accompanied by a multimedia element. It's a choice that we are going to make that complements in a way that is relevant to both teaching and research. The information on this point contained within the sub elements of a media element uh, is uh, as follows. The description of an image is reference form for which we will use the Chicago manual style of the 17th edition. An alternative text to the appearance of the chosen media and the storage uh, um, link of that uh, media, right? So, uh, two ending uh, final remarks. The system developed in this project is based not so much on the development of new techniques, but on the use of all objects for new purpose. Neither the software is new, nor are the standards, nor the concepts we are studying. But if anything differentiates Noticias del Viejo Imperio, uh, 1836, from other projects, it is the way in which these objects, schemas, and concepts are brought together. The application of this software has been limited in, in the first instance to a few project presentation functions, generally oriented to the dissemination of language, since its create, creators recommended not to exceed uh, 20 slides. Of course, any of our narratives exceeds the number of, by far, only two alterations of the code of uh, really easy resolution have made it possible to highly increase that figure, especially if we take into account that we will not employ visual additions to complement our information. Most of the decisions have been taken from positions that are ideological and political meet very close to what is established by minimal computing, as defined as Alex Hill and the Global Outlook, Digital Humanities Initiative. The standards we use, including those of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative, are free and open, as are the markup languages, fonts, software, and even our sources and materials. Um, it was uh, Emmanuel de Valadouri, a French historian, who wrote on May 8, 1978, 68, in Le Nouvel Observateur, that l'historien demain sera programmer ou il ne sera plus. Perhaps the only thing necessary is to establish a constant reflection on the process themselves, on the historian task and social functioning, on the way in which there are constrictions that we may or may not be interested in preserving. Perhaps he has wrong and we did not need to be programmers, but to have the urgency to learn to move in another world that in the past was, as Lowenthal said, such a foreign country. Uh, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, um, Alvaro. Uh, a lot of people do the Chile as a fellow theater of the Spanish South American War, collaboration and nationality, the nationality in the maritime space of the last Spanish stronghold. Uh, Pablo Paredes, which is the same this paper, is from the University of Chile. He has a master's degree in history, uh, another master in economics and public policy, and a bachelor degree in social science from uh, a local yeah. university. <coughs> He's also a master's degree in science and technology studies from the University of Edinburgh. His latest thesis addresses the identity tensions among the communities of Chile during the Spanish South American War, with focus in the indigenous mestizo relationship and the Spanish legacy of this province after 1826. He has collaborated with the Chilean Network of Science and Technology Studies and is a member of the Magazine, Cuadernos de Genealogía, Historia de la Antigua Provincia de Nueva Galicia, Chihuahua. 
The research interests include the history of technology, original history, and administrative history, with a special focus on the state building process in Chile in the 19th century. Go ahead, Pablo. Pablo. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, and you can can you see the presentation? Uh, no, we are see, at this moment we are uh, seeing your uh, stop. Your meet. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I will try again. Yeah, I think <laughs> just press uh, una ventana, one window. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, perfect. Okay, now? Can you hear me now? Perfect, perfect, yeah. Okay, uh, well, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the title of my presentation is, well, as you can see, a little bit long, is a theater of the Spanish South American world. And as a subtitle, a collaboration and nationality in the maritime space of the last, of the last Spanish stronghold of Chile. Uh, as the table for my presentation, uh, well, I'm going to speak a little bit about the research question and the main ideas of this presentation. Later, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background of this, of this idea, uh, first, uh, about Chiloé as a coastal and royalist, or at least uh, royalist in the old times, uh, as, a, as a royalist province. Uh, later, I'm going to, to speak about the Spanish expedition of, of 1866 during the Spanish South American War. Uh, of course, Rodrigo already spoke about uh, the, the scientific expedition, so I'm going to focus a little bit more about the, the episode of the war, and especially in the episode of the war in Chiloé. Uh, later, I'm going to speak uh, more about the coastal information flows between the local communities and the Spanish forces during the war. That is the main idea of this presentation. And finally, I'm going to speak a little more about the discussion and main conclusions of this presentation, especially in two, in two lines. First, the information flows between uh, the actors, so for example, the local actors, the Spanish forces, and of course, also the, the, the Chilean forces that are uh, defending the the archipelago, and also the incident based on this information flows. I'm going to speak a little bit about the incidents of these coastal communities in the course of war. I mean, uh, did these communities change some uh, course, uh, some uh, decisions uh, affected the decision, for example, of the Spanish forces or the Chilean forces? Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit about that. Uh, but before that, I'm going to show. I want to show you uh, this uh, quote from a Guilliche man to Charles Darwin in 1835 that says, "And it is only because we are poor Indians and know nothing." But it was not so when we had a king. Uh, this is a reflection from these indigenous men uh, in the period of the state building process in Chile in 1835, uh, more or less nine years after the conquest of Chile by the Chilean forces. So this is like an idea or a early idea of how the nationality or the national identity of Chile uh, was imposed or at least was uh, an important issue for the local communities and especially indigenous communities of the Chile archipelago in those years. And it will be a very important thing 30 years later uh, during the Spanish South American War. Uh, as a presentation of this research, uh, well, uh, first it's important to say that Chile is a province of coastal culture in southern Chile. It's also an archipelago. Uh, it is well known, for example, now uh, for its cuisine based on seafood and, and seafood and, f and, and fish. Uh, and also in Chilean history, it is recognized uh, as the last royalist stronghold during the independence war until 1826. Uh, this is important to say because uh, the independence war in the central zone of Chile, uh, I mean this, the, the historical Chile or the central Chile, uh, was uh, obtained eight years before. So for the early Republic of Chile, uh, Chiloé was a very 
a special issue for a few years. Uh, the first constitution, for example, does not include Chile. Uh, and a year later, this was uh, finally conquered as the fourth big province. Uh, of course, as you can see now in the map of the, in the right side, uh, now Chiloé is uh, more or less, it's, it's a small province uh, composed basically by the archipelago uh, and it's one of the province of the region district in the lake district or region of the lakes now in southern Chile. It's a second level uh, province, not a region. But in the first years of the Chilean independence, it was a more important province. Uh, this is important to say because in 1966, during the spanish South American War, uh, after, the Pacific, after the Pacific expedition that Rodrigo already spoke about, uh, this place was the hideout of the Chilean Peruvian Navy. Uh, and, and because of this reason, uh, it received two expeditions from the Spanish forces uh, between, December, between January and February of 1866. So we have two situations here. First, we have a royalist province, or at least historical royalist province. And 40 years later, we have an ex two expeditions from the Spanish forces. So this old, the old empire returns to the, to the old colony or to the old territory that was uh, loyal to them. So as uh, research question, uh, I'm going to speak about uh, First is, what do we know about the information flows between the local actors and the Spanish forces during the war? Uh, and second, uh, how, this, how, did, uh, how this information flows affected the course of the war, uh, especially based on the, coastal, on the information flows from the coastal communities to the Spanish forces? This is the main idea of this presentation. As background, uh, was, well, as I already told, uh, in 1810, in 18, uh, when Chile began its independent process, uh, Chile was a peripheral province dependent directly from the vice royalty of Peru. So when Chile started to the independence movement, uh, Chile remained uh, loyal to Peru and therefore to Spain. Uh, in this condition, it fought again the Republican side and even remained loyal to the monarchy even after the fall of Ayacucho in 1924. Uh, so as I said before, it finally fell in 1926, two years later. Uh, during this context, there are some episodes of Hispanic nostalgia, especially among the indigenous people, as the quote that I already showed you uh, shows. Uh, but local elites try to quickly accommodate their position to the national, to the new national authorities. Uh, in this con in this condition, the province of Chile evolved as a stable republican province for the following decades. Uh, this is important. This is important to to say because. Uh, despite of being the last stronghold of the Spanish forces, as many as the history says, uh, after 1826, uh, the province of Chile uh, remained as a very loyal uh, province to Chile. Uh, we don't see or do we, we don't have evidence, for example, of rebellions, uh, or rebellions in royalist terms or pro-Hispanic terms against the Republic of Chile. We have some issues, for example, from the indigenous people, uh, from very local issues, but not in favor uh, of the Spanish uh, forces or the Spanish Empire, at least not in relevant terms. Uh, in parallel to these local circumstances of Chile, uh, in 1933, a private incident known as inc of the Talambo incident in Peru uh, escalated to a diplomatic conflict between Spain and Peru. Uh, this is the beginning of the spanish South american war based on this incident and also related to the historical differences between between peru and spain especially because of the colonial debt and other issues related to the independence process of peru uh, this episode finally resulted in the capture of the chincha islands by the spanish uh, ships of the pacific scientific expedition uh, this is of course very very far from Chile, it is in 1833, it is still a, prof, a conflict between Peru and Spain. Uh, however, uh, in this context, uh, Chile, because of several reasons, uh, Pan-Americanism on one side, economic interest on the other side, uh, there are many reasons why Chile took this, a decision about this, uh, decided to, to, to take part in this conflict between Peru and Spain, and finally, uh, was the first con uh, the first country uh, in declaring the war against Spain because of this conflict of the Chincha Island. However, the, cap the military capacities of Peru and Chile combined were weak compared to Spain. Uh, we have, of course, two uh, Latin American countries. Uh, in this context, uh, the, the naval capacities of these countries were weaker. And Spain, as, already Rod as Rodrigo already said some minutes before, 
uh, was in a moment that was uh, strengthening the capacities uh, because of this pan-Hispanic pan movement or this idea of recovering some influence in this continent. However, in, uh, from the Spanish side, uh, there is already there is also an internal process of uh, buying new ships, especially the Huascar and Independencia, that were very important a few years later during the Pacific War between Chile and Peru. Uh, however, this, uh, these two ships uh, were were still uh, in in journey, for, uh, were still uh, traveling uh, from the United Kingdom to Peru. So uh, these two countries, Peru and Chile, had to resist in some place safe for their uh, for the uh, ship that they already have. Uh, so in this meantime, uh, that were waiting for the, the ships, the Huascar Independencia, the combined army was sent to Chiloé, a territory that was well, well, well known for being the uh, for of tough navigation conditions and therefore safe for the South American forces. Uh, as I already said, Chiloé is an archipelago. Uh, the navigation conditions are very hard for the people that do not know about how to uh, navigate there. So it was the perfect hideout for a more or less weak army uh, of Peru and, and Chile. This is the context of why uh, the why the the Spanish uh, the Spanish army finally uh, sailed to Chile in 1966. That is the background of why do we have uh, a conflict or at least a military conflict in Chile during those years. Uh, about the coastal information flows, we have uh, two episodes. Uh, first, uh, we have the first expeditions of the Spanish forces uh, trying to discover the hideout uh, between January and February of uh, 1866, and a second uh, expedition between February and March of, 80, of 1866. In the case of the first expedition uh, that started on January, January 20, uh, the ships Banca and Villa de Madrid sailed from Valparaiso to Juan Fernandez Archipelago, and after ruling out the presence of the enemy, uh, sailed out to uh, Puerto Oscuro, Puerto Mon, and Ancud in Chile Island. Uh, this route is very interesting to know because at the beginning they didn't know if they didn't know where the Peruvian and Chilean forces were hiding. Were hiding. Uh, first, they went to Juan Fernandez Archipelago. Uh, there they were very very well received by the local people because they didn't know that about the outbreak of the war uh, of course these people collaborated with them but not because they were royalists but because they didn't know about the war uh, but when uh, they go to Chiloé uh, because to weather conditions they avoided the direct access to the north of the archipelago uh, and in first place they decided to visit a uh, Huaytecas island in the southern part of the archipelago it is not actually part of the archipelago, but it's a big island uh, in the southern part of this region. And from that island, they moved to Puerto Oscuro, uh, a small place in the middle of the main island of the archipelago of Chiloé. And in this place, we have uh, different informations uh, about what happened, what actually happened there. From the local information that are saved in the Archivo Naval de Madrid, uh, we, we know that uh, the, the official information from the from the from the Navy said that they they didn't uh, find any kind of people there that it was an abandoned place. But from a letter from one of the sailors that was published in La, Correp in La Correspondencia de España in Madrid, uh, we have additional information that says that actually in that place uh, there were a lot of people and that those people, local people from the coast, uh, su uh, brought supplies from the, for the Spanish forces, and even one, uh, people, uh, one man living there, a German settler, according to the sources, uh, even uh, sold them the information about where, the, where was the hideout of the, of the Peruvian Chilean forces. Uh, and this place was later known as the Octavo Bay. Uh, so this is important because at the beginning they didn't know about uh, what, where was the hideout. Uh, they didn't know that the local people would be uh, um, would bring them information and supplies. But actually, this happened and this changed uh, the decisions of the of these ships after this moment. Uh, in February 7, uh, of course, after this uh, visit to Puerto Oscuro, they headed to Octavo, and in this place they received help from other local fishermen. Uh, this is a very interesting episode because, according to the information, to the official information, this uh, local fisherman uh, was cheated, and he considered that the Spanish forces were actually Peruvian. 
but it is not so clear that he actually believed this. Uh, and after this, after this uh, encounter between the local fishermen and the, and the Spanish forces, uh, was the outbreak of the well-known Battle of Atao that many of you know. Uh, this battle finished without a clear winner uh, because if the, it was um, there was some bombardment of the local area, there was bombardment again also the Spanish forces, but there were not uh, real damage or at least serious damage for both of the sides. And while the Spanish forces finally returned to El Paraiso, the South American fleet moved to the near Guito Fjord. So this is the context of the first expedition, of the first Spanish, Spanish expedition. And these were the two uh, episodes that uh, the local communities were key, at least to this result that was the Battle of Aftau in of February 7th. The second expedition uh, was uh, was composed by a different by a different organization. First, of course, uh, Blanca continued being one of the ships that uh, traveled to southern Chile. But in place of Villa de Madrid, uh, the second ship in this case was Numancia, the the strongest uh, ship of the expedition. Uh, this expedition of Numancia and Blanca followed the same route as the first, uh, sites uh, site in Chile on February 26 and anchoring in Huaytecas two days later. So it was basically the same route uh, from the north to the south, and then traveling through the uh, interior uh, sea of Chiloé. From Huaytecas, they continued to Puerto Oscuro, the same place as before. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, at night, uh, an old indigenous man informed them that the Chilean army was expecting, uh, expecting them to, um, uh, was expecting to ambush them in the next morning. Uh, uh, this is an episode that is later known as with the combat, but actually it was a very small combat. Uh, and also this old indigenous man expressed his nostalgia about the King Ferdinand, uh, because he, he didn't know that the King Ferdinand already, was already there 30 years later, 30 years before. So it, uh, it from an uh, anthropologic way of thinking, this is a very interesting episode, but also it is important to know that this, that this episode of Bring of um, of the old indigenous men uh, also was key uh, for the Spanish forces to avoid a direct conflict with the with the Chilean forces that were hidden uh, in this place of Puerto Oscuro. That of course they already knew that it was used uh, to receive supplies in the first expedition. Uh, after this episode on March two, uh, the Spanish fleet moved to the abandoned place of Atao because they thought that the Chilean Peruvian forces were still there. Uh, of course, they were not. Uh, but in this place, they made contact with local people from the near Tabon Island. That is a very long island close to the place of Aptao. And in this place, that these people that was uh, that was supposed to be to, to believe that these people were uh, Peruvians during the first expedition, actually brought them supplies and informed them informed them about the new hideout of Widow. So actually, these people were. Uh, very aware that these people, that the people from the ships were from Spain, but they were very um, interested in bringing them supplies. Uh, of course, there is a difference between military forces and local people of the com of coastal communities. Uh, but even some reports from the people that was part of this expedition says that uh, the people from the islands uh, were st uh, considered still uh, as loyal people to Spain. Uh, and it is also this is also this is also something that uh, Chilean uh, Marines officers some year later uh, still consider as being true. Uh, even Vicuña Maquena, Benjamin Vicuña Maquena, uh, 40 or 30 years later, uh, still uh, write about this phenomenon of local islanders that were still loyal to, us, to the King of Spain in those years. Uh, of course, based on this expedition, the Spaniards tried to reach Witte, that is what was the new hideout, but the fjord was blocked and fortified, so uh, they couldn't uh, they, they couldn't have a, a clear battle as before, and they decided to return to Valparaiso to decide the next steps of the war. And in the picture that you can see on the right, there are some remains of the log of Witte that are uh, conserved in the Calbuco Museum in Southern Chile. Uh, it is still as an important part of local history for that, for that commune. So as uh, discussion about the information flows, 
uh, we can consider at first from a social network perspective the Chilean people, including local, including uh, Chilean authorities and Peruvian officers, work as part of the same network. Uh, they share information and even troops during the campaigns. On the contrary, the Spanish fleet was isolated in a hostile continent. Of course, they have communications with Madrid, with the national authorities of Spain, but it was very far from the from the theater of war. In this context, the Spanish fleet was more or less abandoned in this continent. Uh, in this context, the peripheral indigenous groups of Chiloé acted as brokers between these both worlds, uh, providing critical information to risk the Spanish expedition. Uh, this is important to notice because uh, this connection emerges from unexpected contacts. The, the Spanish forces didn't know that they would receive supplies from local communities during this war. Uh, and for this reason, these episodes were not considered as inputs for the decision-taking process of the Spanish officers, at least before the expeditions. Of course, during the expedition, the decision taking process changed, and these inputs were considered, for example, from moving from Puerto Oscuro to Octavo to other places, but not before. They didn't expect this. Uh, and as the Spaniards didn't expect, but uh, I mean, uh, while the, Sp the Spaniards didn't expect here from the locals, due to, to these asymmetries of information after 40 years of connection, this was not the case of the Chileans, uh, of the Chilean authorities. Uh, actually, they did fear some level of collaboration due to historical reason, because, as I said before, Chiloé was a royalist stronghold before, but also because of contemporary reasons. It was an epoch of increasing distrust toward the indigenous population uh, because of positivism and many other reasons of the, of the stamps. And just to finish, because I know that <laughs> I don't have too much time, uh, the few contacts that the Spanish fleet uh, made in with the Antabon proved to be notably influential for the course of war, uh, because, of course, uh, they didn't expect this, but with this information, they changed, they changed some decisions. Uh, the discovery of Aftar Haidat, for example, with the consequent battle in an insulated bay, prevented military action in highly populated cities as Ancud or Puerto Montt, my hometown, by the way. <laughs> this is relevant to notice, consider that the only ship defending Ancud was the Esmeralda, a critically important ship for the Chilean army a few years later during this Pacific War against Peru. Uh, and also, uh, just to finish, the same informants prevented them to run aground in the sandbanks of Tabón and even to avoid a lengthy search of the second hide of Huitl. And this is relevant considering that the Spanish fleet had limited fuel and supplies and had to rely on, fan, on fast campaigns. So just to finish, this is the, the relevance, in my opinion, the incidents of the local communities during the course of war based on these information flows between local communities and Spanish forces. This is. Okay, thank you, mm. uh, Pablo. Now, mm -hmm. the comments will be in charge of uh, Fernando Wilson, Fernando Wilson from the University of Occidental in Chile, who holds a PhD in history and a master's um, degree, um, degree in political science and international relations from the Catholic University of Chile. Uh, he holds several other studies. He teach uh, currently at the uh, University as a full-time professor at the Department of History and the School of that university. Also teach at the Naval Chile and Naval Law Colleges at the University of Chile and the Chilean Military Academy. We have a, a number of publications um, will be presented in paper. So go ahead, Fernando. First of all, thank you very much for the trusting that I will be able to sum up uh, something me uh, roughly current out of the three wonderful presentations we had uh, today. First of all, how much time do I have to, to give the presentation? So I understand 15 minutes or something like that, or? Well, that, that, that would be fine. Well, okay. okay. Well, first of all, uh, Rodrigo Escribano told us, uh, had a, a very interesting presentation regarding uh, the application of a rather peculiar concept to the um, uh, Spanish naval renaissance of the mid 18th, uh, 19th century, uh, applying the concept of talasocracy, which links very well the, the combination of uh, maritime and naval aspirations within the context of a new empire uh, being cradled, being created precisely on the basis of a British approach. 
uh, the thoughts about by Professor Goni resulted, which were cut at the end of the presentation, resulted particular uh, in a particularly interesting approach in terms that they um, sum up this sort of Mahanian uh, approach some 50 years before the publication of the influence of history uh, upon uh, oh, the influence of uh, sea power upon history. In that sense, his approach in regard of the decline of the traditional naval uh, sea power held by the Spanish Navy during, from the 16th up to the 19th century and finally uh, demolished, not just by Trafalgar, but the Spanish independence war, uh, are very well uh, presented in terms of the aspirations of the rebuilding of this power uh, based on the technological advances brought forward by the second uh, naval revolution, it's an industrial revolution. In that sense, steam power, iron hulls, armor, uh, breech loading and uh, rifled artillery all provided the instruments for rebuilding at the same rate that major naval powers such as France and Britain were approaching. In that sense, the order for uh, the, the first two ocean-going uh, ironclads built in France uh, Numancia and Tetuan uh, put the Spanish Navy in a very expectating uh, position in regards to other major naval powers uh, as they were pretty modern and very, very capable units. In that sense, uh, the, these uh, ships and a uh, succession of other uh, mixed propulsion vessels being ordered at the time uh, helped to configure it uh, modern fleet that could be uh, considered as a particularly useful tool in the context of uh, power projection. And that was precisely what uh, Rodrigo told us was attempted by combining both the geopolitical thought of the time and sea power as a tool uh, with the expectation of opening uh, new relations with the former uh, Spanish kingdoms uh, in the Pacific coast of South America and how to uh, combine the, this uh, approach into a source of influence. Unfortunately, Rodrigo, he foretold us that he was still in the first stages of his research, uh, ha was most uh, concerned in, into the aspects of how this would uh, result in, or which was going to be the mixture of uh, hard and soft power that the Spanish smart power approach was going to generate within uh, Latin America uh, at the time. Anyway, uh, the awful uh, developments, most uh, particularly the more than known uh, Salazar de Mazarreo's affair and the uh, Chinch Island takeover led to an unexpected war that finally didn't have a strategic uh, objective or approach. In that sense, the Spanish-South American War is a textbook case of a mismanaged conflict, as it doesn't have a clearly uh, specified neither political and strategic objective, uh, a current strategy derived from them, or even a tactical approach uh, that went beyond uh, the blockading of several Chilean and Peruvian ports, which couldn't really be effective on a long-term basis. Nevertheless, he, he uh, Rodrigo makes a very good uh, situation in terms of presenting the development of that uh, evolution of uh, Spanish conception on sea power. And, uh, well, I may add that the wrapping up of the concepts into the context of navalism, the prevailing uh, strate uh, strategic thought based on the use of navies, both as an imperial tool and uh, to the building of sea lines of communications, which became the hallmark of imperial industrial powers of the 19th century. Uh, most certainly provides a tool that can be used for the wrapping up of his approach in a most interesting approach. In that sense, uh, the, uh, the, the, the use and the re reference of Professor Goñi's uh, summing up of the Spanish geopolitical aspirations seem to be very interesting and, not, and I will strongly encourage him uh, that in the context of the development of this project to turn him into perhaps the presentation for a next session of the Macmillan uh, Symposium. Uh, 
in that uh, concluding that presentation we have then uh, dr castilla alvaro castilla offering us an extremely interesting and uh, very modern approach in terms of uh, his project uh, his uh, of the digital uh, of creating a digital repository uh, for sources related to the news of the old empire in that sense this more be than being a proper historical presentation is an extremely interesting uh, f uh, breath of fresh air in uh, approach in terms of creating a new platform for uh, historiographical research. In that sense, it has a dual approach in terms that it provides both an analysis of its impact in historiography. Uh, the use of uh, online uh, databases are extremely interesting, but uh, both in the dual flows that this allows into the material building of actual history. His extremely detailed approach into the technological approaches uh, resulted in a very interesting approach for me. I consider myself as a sort of technological geek, so I really enjoyed your presentation into the terms of software choices, etc. But that can be summed up for people not so linked to that approach into that he's uh, providing a very comprehensive and very thoughtful approach into guaranteeing both the stability the software stability and the approachability of the resource so it's a not just a bunch of documents put up uh, online but rather a very sophisticated platform that ensures both a very strong stability of the resource in on a middle to long-term basis and at the same time a very uh, sophisticated approach into the usability of the sources uploaded into that sense i'm probably losing a lot of other concepts but i guess i can in the framework of time I, we have now i can think i managed to sum up that approach and then, well, we have the Dr. Pare Pare Paulo Paredes approach as uh, Chiloé being presented as a peripheral theater of operations within the context of, this, of the Spanish-South South American War. It was a very interesting approach in terms that he focused that on the basis of local, uh, local reports and local um, information concentrated mostly into the information flows of what could on the basis of uh, dr seligman's research uh, be considered as uh, the build up or build up of a st uh, strategic intelligence approach with concrete operational and uh, tactical uh, downloads on that same uh, perspective in that in that approach the, after the, his uh, very complete presentation regarding the net nature the social nature uh, of the isolation of the population in the Chiloé archipelago he then concentrated into the two expeditions carried out by the spanish fleet into the area uh, in that sense uh, the ability or the strategic ability of using intelligence generated by the lack of knowledge, the lack of contact of the local inhabitants, fishermen and the like, uh, use, uh, isolated from the rest of Chile and the world, not knowing of the fact of a war going on, would be a regular uh, incident during the um, situation through uh, decades uh, that would happen decades afterwards it must be remembered that during the first world war uh, the german kreuzer jeschwader uh, of the ostasian fl uh, flotte the von space fleet uh, when it anchored off uh, easter island they managed to get both coal and food even standing uh, cattle uh, because the Chilean governor of the island wasn't uh, conscious that a war had erupted in Europe and uh, that he should apply neutrality rules to this German fleet. The same happened, although with limitations yet, yet again uh, at the Juan Fernandez archipelago for the first German approach. In that sense, it provides a continuity of the perspective of, of the impact of uh, isolation on uh, of the Chilean maritime territory in uh, terms of its geopolitical impact and provides a second line of investigation and research that could be pretty interesting. In that sense, uh, the detailed analysis of the specific contacts with fishermen and, and local inhabitants, the fact that a German immigrant was uh, 
uh, one or uh, the one that with most certainty uh, struck uh, an economical deal for getting uh, a reward for providing information uh, at the same time show the weakness and the strengths of the choice of uh, losing of, of hiding the the allied peruvian and chilean fleet within the uh, southern archipelagos in terms that the difficulties of navigation on the first stage didn't prove as tough as originally thought as the spanish fleet did manage to reach uh, the fleet anchorage at uh, aptao even despite lacking neither uh, charts nor pilots in order to get to the position but at the same time the threat was very strong in terms that for instance, uh, the decision to depart uh, before forcing an action at Wito uh, by facing the fortifications and preparations that included the sunk uh, steamer Maipu and the coastal batteries built on the axes uh, of the to the fjord uh, meant that uh, in in the in a ultimate condition the Spanish fleet was acutely aware that any risk such as the grounding of a major vessel in particular the ironclad numancia could be fatal for the developments of the fleet perhaps the finding of the grounded remains of the peruvian frigate america were a sobering uh, reminder of the risks they were running uh, the decision of to retreat to valparaiso were most certainly uh, defined on that by that sense all in all, we can wrap uh, this, uh, these three presentations on a very practical and interesting perspective in terms that despite being a well-known conflict, uh, new research is not just viable on the, these well-trodden patches of history, but at the same time, it's always possible to unearth new information, to generate new resources, new technical approaches into these uh, this, um, research subjects, and at the same time, uh, to provide local approaches that still pr uh, show interesting uh, instruments into the analysis and research into these uh, conditions. Uh, the a long uh, pending uh, issue is the technical studies of the vessels included into this uh, into this war, which provide us with uh, an extremely interesting cutout of the technological advances of the period. A first generation ironclad, uh, such as Numancia, a brand new concept such as a turret ship in the shape of Huascar, uh, the American uh, originally coastal and riverine monitor Monadnock, which passed through the Chilean coast uh, on, on just uh, before the war, and at the same time, the orders for a number of other technologically advanced vessels, both by Peru and later on by Chile itself on 1872, as a consequence of the war. So, not just uh, the three presenters have shown us interesting issues, re refreshingly interesting new issues regarding uh, the studied subject, but at the same time, open new analysis uh, issues and new threads through which we could uh, develop and evolve and actually suggest several issues uh, several new topics for presenting on the next session of the Macmillan um, uh, symposium so thank you very much for standing me if Rodrigo's English was rusty well mine is almost dead so I guess uh, I ask for the excuses regarding my rather rough and tumble English, which has most definitely seen better years, uh, better days. At the, thank you very much for all, and I hope I managed myself to be to transmit any knowledgeable or understandable idea through these uh, through these words. Thank you very much again. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Now we have a few, well, not a few, a little bit of time. If one has any questions, we mm -hmm. are not so much so uh, those who are um, on google meet can also express his uh, interest i just was uh want to say something a little bit about i know uh, chile was somehow forgotten by, by the government on little relation with the spanish but uh two things uh, should remember that 
the Spanish trade were established in the Pacific late in the 1820s. And that's one point. So I don't know if Chile was visited by Spanish ships, not warships, but ships. And secondly, there was this previous warship trip along the Pacific, which is the Carolina in the 1850s. So the relation between the Spain as a wall and the Spanish Navy as a part of that wall should be taken into account. It's, it's not 1821 or 24 or 26 and then 1866. There is something in between that should be considered. And of course, there were a number of Chile or Spaniards who remained there. I don't know how many of them remained in Chile or in other parts. Uh, that's something that maybe you can think about. Uh, okay, our big audience would make some questions. Yeah, sure. Okay, sure. go ahead. I'm sure there are questions online as well. Oh, sure. Well. Uh, so I don't want to preempt the conversation, but I, I, I will have uh, just invited absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for uh, fascinating proposals. I, I, our, our presentations, I learned a lot. And um, for the research that's mostly aspirational at this point, I look forward to seeing how it develops. And I do hope that you come back to present in future iterations of this uh, conference. I could ask questions of, of everyone here. Um, I, I'm Tommy Jameson, by the way. I'm a professor of military history at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Um, but, you know, the old capital, Alta, California, I guess we'd be, uh, we should say properly here. Um, and I'll just ask one question, and it's for um, Rodrigo. Um, there's this wonderful book out by Andrew Lambert in recent yeah. years, Sea Power States. You know, which makes an argument that there there are many ways to approach the sea as a society, and and you make the case that Spain is taking uh, you know a, a, a thalassocratic approach to the sea, um, but most of the presentation that you've given us is about naval power, and uh, Andrew Lambert would say that's sort of that's a navalist perspective, and not necessarily a thalassocratic perspective. So you know. Is this about reorganizing Spanish society to be based around the sea, to be to be linked economically and socially and culturally around the sea, or is it about naval power that allows Spain to project its influence geopolitically in South America? Just sort of curious about what, what this word means to you. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Uh, I, I think it's a very intelligent and, and wise question. I, I, I have chosen the term thalassocratic because of something that maybe does not appear explicitly in, the, in my presentation because there is it's another dimension of this phenomenon. I think that liberal elites have this idea uh, not only to transform the state power and the military forces uh, of Spain, in order to well to try to incentivate naval power, naval modernization, I think also there is another dimension of this problem that is naval patriotism. I mean, uh, along with these efforts uh, of modernization and of ideological reinterpretation of the keys of uh, for the regeneration of uh, Spanish imperial power, there is also. Um, an intention of uh, identifying the Spaniards, uh, all the inhabitants of the Spanish state, with the idea that the prosperity of the nation uh, um, must be uh, uh, seek in the sea. Uh, and there is this effort uh, for incentivating uh, the maritime culture along the coast of uh, Spain. Uh, so. I think that um, uh, well, the phenomenon that I have um, that I have begin to that I have begun to to analyze uh, uh, is more ample, is ampler than simply uh, a kind of geopolitical planification. There is also a cultural dimension and uh, a clear intention of um, well, that's it of implanting a maritime culture uh, over all the population of Spain. And an example of this is 
how uh, the state and uh, also uh, some city councils make an enormous effort that all uh, the Spanish citizens uh, know uh, uh, the events of the war. The war is, uh, well, the, the, the Spanish South American war is uh, an episode of uh, naval nationalism uh, in Spain. Uh, we can see commemorations for uh, the fallen sailors. Uh, uh, new, um, well, some theatrical shows where they vindicate the glory of the Spanish Navy. Uh, and all this is um, also complemented by an effort for the regeneration of the, uh, well, of the merchant Navy and also for the regeneration of international uh, Spanish uh, uh, commerce trade uh, in the world. So, uh, it's not simply navalism. Uh, I mean, I, it's navalism, obviously, there is uh, a clear uh, intention for um, uh, uh, um, planifying the regeneration of Spanish imperial power uh, um, in, in the base of the imitation of uh, um, in United Kingdom navalism, but there is so... Also, uh, yeah. uh, your, your question, we, 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 we sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're taking off the show. Uh, somebody uh, on Google uh, Meet want to make some question. Somebody of the remote attendance want to make some question. Otherwise, go ahead. No second time. Don't worry, I, I was finishing anyway. Uh, uh, I, I love to uh, speak. Uh, and the only thing that I want to say is that with Thalassocracy, I was trying also to catch this cultural dimension of the phenomena. This yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, Rodrigo. We, we, we understand that. Uh, <laughs> we will talk later on. Okay. Yeah, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, it, uh, I suppose. It, the people online are welcome to ask questions of themselves as well. So, uh, Alvaro, this, this presentation, um, I think, opens up the frontiers of, of what is possible uh, in terms of, of, of what history looks like in the 21st century. Um, we have lots of examples of what this looks like technically in terms of your method. But are, are we able to learn, what, what do you hope to learn sort of concretely? What, what are we going to learn from this sort of method? Um, what are its advantages to us? You're putting together, you know, different types of media, different types of sources together in the same common database and then displaying them. Do you, do you have aspirations or hopes that we'll learn something new uh, from, from this sort of approach? What are some of the, the benefits of it over a, a more traditional, more orthodox approach? So you got nothing to this with a problem. Yes. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All are all under there. Well, Alvaro is not here. Uh, he has he had to left, but I'm here and, and at your disposal to to answer your question. Well, uh, we we're not just uh, making an advantage of uh, the multimedia uh, virtual world. We're not mixing anything. Uh, we're trying, in fact, to eliminate any intrusion of uh, code of coding of programming in the text we're trying to offer the text as it is as it is in the source transcribed not uh, with uh, every of uh, of its characteristics not uh, not with its smell <laughs> but uh, of course uh, with all its information uh, whether we are uh, trying to locate events in a map or we are trying to uh, order them in timeline we're also serializing data we don't understand them as, as data in fact we understand them as capta because we are transforming them as, as we get it hmm. well um json is an opportunity json is an opportunity because it exceeds the capabilities of XML, of HTML5, of any other programming languages uh, which are due to, to serve as, as a link uh, with the historical documents and, 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 the, and the media world. Uh, what we were trying to do is, uh, first step, 
uh, step in this in this in this way. Uh, in fact, uh, next uh, I think uh, October the the twenty fifth, we're going to present the, this uh, this uh, evolution in in the TEI conference, uh, which is uh, the, the main event uh, worldwide uh, in addition world. Okay, thanks. Uh, we got a question. Someone raised his hand. David. I did, I did. I did to talk. No, oh, no. David Hardy, raise, did you raise your hand? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, okay, there are no questions here. No last chance. That's it. Okay. Well, I think we are done. I uh, will thank you very much for your presentations, uh, for provide some fresh approach to this world. This is a complex world. I should remember that uh, Peru was still a war with Spain. We didn't recognize Spain, didn't recognize Peruvian independence until the next war, which was the war in Peru, actually. So officially, we're still a war. Uh, so this is a, a complex situation. Uh, we have to be uh, a kind of a normal in which technological approaches were faced by Spain. In Spain, which uh, in your case, Rodrigo need to clarify a little bit more this idea of philosophy and naval power itself. Uh, uh, in which uh, a number of uh, relations uh, exist between our countries. The Ministry of War of Spain was the Peruvian, the one who took the oh, was, yeah, the one who took the islands, the Chich Islands, was from Lima. Uh, so it, this is the kind of war we used to have. The very American world. Well, many thanks once again on till the next session. Bye bye.